I'm Chris. I'm a fourth year PhD student from UC Santa Barbara. And today I'm happy to share our work, the CRISP Critical Path Analysis on a Large Scale Microservice Architectures. This is a collaborated work between UC Santa Barbara and Uber. So, first, let me give you a very quick background information what is microservices architecture? So, microservice is compared with a traditional monolithic design, it's more distributed because each function or business logic of your system is divided into independent parts, and in each part is implemented by independent programs. So, and the, the independent programs normally communicate with each other over the well-defined APIs, and typically through the RPC or the remote procedure calls. And all of them are loosely coupled because they communicate with each other, but at the same time, they are independent. So another characteristic of these microservices is each small services is normally owned by the different independent or self-contained team, and it can, they can just develop this stuff very fastly. All right. Then you may ask, why do we need microservices? Because they offer scalable development. Specifically, because the services are independent, they can just be developed independently. And it also allows the companies or uh, the service owners to deploy the stuff e more easily. As a result, a survey from last year shows that more than 71% of organizations fully or partially adopted the microservices. However, this fast growing of the microservices also brought many challenges, and particularly the complexity. The evolution of the microservices also leads to very complex interactions. And those interactions add a lot of difficulties to analyze. Specifically, those interactions are very frequently just deeply nested, and they are also asynchronized. So you can imagine if you have tens of thousands of endpoints interact with each other, and I'm gonna ask, okay, my service is slow down. What's the problem, for, what's the root cause for this? It's really hard to answer. So here's a screenshot from Uber a couple years ago, and in this graph, each node is a service, and each edges are the interactions between services. Because you can, now you can imagine if I ask, okay, it's slow down. It's really hard to answer why. So, a couple of tools has been developed for analyze this microservices architecture, and distributed tracing is one of the commonly used one. And it's really helped us to understand the business logic and our business workflow. And specifically, I want to talk about Jaeger tracing used in Uber for this presentation. So Jaeger, it's a system to capturing all the RPC calls between caller and callee among the services. And it tracks all the RPC calls and build an end-to-end -end trace for the service. And it's widely deployed at Uber and supports multiple languages, including Go, Java, Python, and so on. And one, in one interesting feature of Jaeger is it collects the trace on a sampling basis. So it doesn't need to collect all the traces, which might be way too much expensive to, to capture. However, Jaeger, at the same time, also works well since it captures end-to-end -end, uh, request. So it stores all the trace and spans independently without synchronizing between caller and callees. Only in the unique request ID is carried between caller and callee to reconstruct the entire graph in the post-processing. Also, Jaeger supports multiple storage uh, systems. For example, Cassandra, Elastic uh, Search, in memory or some other more uh, techniques. But again, even I give you this Jaeger chase, it's still hard to answer like, okay, what's causing the end-to-end -end latency of a specific request or service? Here's a sort of a visualization of some relatively simple traces from Uber. As, it, as you can see, it's quite complicated. Also here, it only shows you the visualization without the overlap. In reality, there's a lot of overlap in, in the, on the timelines, so it's really hard to analyze. So here, I will say our solution in this paper is we use the critical path analysis on the distributed systems. Oh, sorry, on the distributed traces. So it supports 
three main functionalities. The first is top-down uh, analysis. It aims for the service owner to debug and optimize their service that they are interested. And second, we offer the bottom-up analysis, which is sort of like systematic analyze to give you a whole, whole level, a upper level, whole picture of your entire system across the data center. And third, we also help for the anomaly detection, which is definitely helpful to build uh, automatic alerting systems. And here's the outline of my talk, and I, then I will give you some brief introductions of what is critical path analysis and what's the difficulties applying those in the real data center. So critical path analysis is a well-known technique from HPC community, and, and it's, it's really helpful to identify the longest stretch of the dependent tasks. And the, important of the importance of the critical path analysis is if you want to shorten your end-to-end -end latency, it's required by shortening your, uh, the latency on your critical path. So we think that critical path analysis naturally simplifies the complex dependency graph we collected from distributed tracing. And how to compute that, I won't give you the full algorithm here because there are a lot of those online, or you can also refer to our, uh, our paper. But at a high level, it's just iteratively going back from the timelines and call those computation algorithms recursively. Let me run a quick examples here. So suppose you have a parent span A, the parent service A, it costs B, and it also costs C, and C maybe also costs D and E. So how, how can we uh, identify the critical path for, from this trace? First, we'll start from the, the, the end of the timeline T10. We just walk backward. Okay, what's the last returned child from A? We can see it's C from T9, right? So this is added as a, as a critical path. All right, then we move on to the C, because C returns last. We recursively cause what's the last returned child of C? We will figure out, okay, it's E. So this second part, this TA to T9, will be added to the critical path. Similarly, this third part on E, because that E is the last return child from C, and so on and so forth. So important, important stuff here is notice that uh, the span D or service D from times T6 to T7 is not on the critical path, because it's not the last return child of service C. So by just running this algorithms, we can construct the full a critical path graph, a critical path analysis here. All right, then you may ask, sounds like this is doable, why not just applying this critical path analysis on a real world traces directly? It turns out that Jaeger does not actually have the sync or AKA the last arrival information from the trace directly, which means all those sync or last arrival informations needs to be inferred by using the timestamp. And what's more, the, the different physical machines are not perfectly synchronized. And those clock skews will brought errors to the critical path analysis, which I will show you later. Also, on the other hand, there are a lot of missing spans in the traces, which just uh, increase the difficulties of applying CPA to the trace directly. So here, let me give you a real simple example. A is a parent span. It calls B, C, D in strictly sequential order. So what is a critical path for this case? It's easy to imagine. Uh, sorry, this should be D, C, B. So basically B, C, D, sorry, but all the B, C, and D are all the, on the critical path. So A actually contributes a very minor uh, time span on it. But in real reality, what we observe is there are very frequently some overlap between each endpoint. So specifically in this case, B overlap with C and C overlap with D. So if we run the critical path analysis here, we will see, okay, this D is on the critical path. That's fine. But at the time T4, what's the last return child from, for A? It's not C, because C doesn't return yet. It's actually B. So this entire stuff is, entire time is contributed to A instead of C. And as a result, you will notice that 
C is not on the critical path. And here is a sort of a plot chart we collected by comparing the what's the first end point of the first child minus the start point of the second child. So technically, this value should be negative because the first child finished first and then the second child starts because this is a strictly sequential order. However, in reality, we collect more than thousands of traces. We can clearly see that because of the overlap, you can't really run the critical path analysis directly. So our solution here is we will just allow some degrees of the overlap between child endpoints if there's nothing in between and there are more details, please refer to our paper. All right, then I will just uh, briefly talk about the design of the CRISP. It's named after the critical path and span. So first, assume you have microservices. You collect the traces use, uh, using Jaeger. So for CRISP, the first step is it's going to collect the trace from the database. And after that, you will compute a critical path for each of the traces. Once we have all the, all the critical paths, we, there are two things we can do. First is we can generate the critical path report in the blue arrows you can see. Or alternatively, we can also compute the feature vectors and put those feature vectors into machine learning models that can be used for the automatic uh, anomaly detection and alerting later. So this is the visualization of the frame graph. It's one of the top-down analysis we're catering for the service owner if they want to figure out, okay, why is my service slow? And as you can see, Flame Graph is a popular tool that you can interact, search, to see, okay, what's the time span on each side, and you can also see the call chains, entire call chains, just back and forth. And more importantly, we compute the differential Flame Graphs on, on those two uh, P, P values, specifically the P50 value, the median value, and the P95, which is like the tail latency. So by taking those two diff between those two, we figure out on one of the important service at Uber shows like on the bottom of the top left, you can, if you can read, it's Cassandra read. So basically between P50 and P95, this Cassandra read increased more than 47%. And as a result, we we just recommend the developers to cache the results in place instead of querying this expensive database operations every time. Then let me move on to the bottom-up analysis, which is sort of a gives the overview for the system administrators to have a, some sort of idea of how the system is running in the database. There are more results in the paper. Uh, here I will only briefly talk about two pictures. So first, let me, let me tell you how to read this one. The x axis is unique endpoints in the each trace. Basically meaning, okay, I have a trace. How many endpoints are there in the trace? And the y axis is a count. So suppose I have one trace, it has 1,000 nodes, 1,000 unique endpoints, then it will be probably somewhere on the 1,000 over there and counts that histogram plus one. Similarly, on the right, we have the number of the unique endpoints on the critical path. So the traces are exactly the same, but we're only we're comparing the unique endpoints on the whole graph versus the unique endpoints on the critical path. So as we can see, like on the whole graph, there are more than 1,000 endpoints for several for certain traces, but on the right, for the same graph on the critical path, the number significantly reduced to around 140. So that's roughly about 10x difference. And another interesting observation we have is on the left, the unique endpoints for in each trace, the distribution is more like a power law. But on the right, this is sort of a more uh, mono monotonically decreasing. All right, then let me just uh, talk about what is uh, why we need anomaly detection and why is it important. So, Suppose we, uh, the system de detects some bugs and you, you can just automatically generate an alert to the service owners so that they can try to figure out, okay, what's causing any troubles, meltdown, slowdown of the service. That's why we think this tool is really helpful. So we, we compared our work 
by using uh, uh, on top of the auto encoder decoder based uh, uh, baseline. The key difference here is in the original work, they're using the whole graph as an input to, to training and do the inference. But the case for us, we use the critical path uh, as an input. So we run on numerous real important services from Uber. And give, let's give you some quick metrics summarize of what are those services look like. So typically they have around 200 to 1,500 unique endpoints on each service, sorry, on each service or trace. And in terms of a span number, like the nodes, how many nodes in a graph, it varies from 1,500 to more than 11,000. So it turns out that the, the critical path analysis based data can show uh, significantly speed up for both training and inference. Also, it generates way much better results in terms of recall. So specifically, when we're talking about the accuracy of the anomaly detections, there are mainly two metrics where we care about. First is precision. It basically means, okay, I give you some abnormal data. Can you tell them? It, sh it shows that both method, the original work and the critical path-based analysis, both of them works roughly well. You can check in, uh, from the paper. And I will talk a little bit more on the recalls in this case. So the importance of recall basically means, okay, how many false, gen false alarms are you gonna, false positive are you gonna generate? And uh, basically, the higher the number close to one, it means the less false alarm you're gonna generate. So specifically here, we can take a look for service three and service five. The original work actually generated tons of false alarm, which probably gonna annoy the service owner. But on the right, we can see the crisp just uh, consistently generate very few uh, false uh, alarm. And next, let's take a look at the training and inference speed up. So first is the training speed up for CRISP. Because the dimensionality of the critical path is way much smaller than the full, full graph, it can, it can generate significant speed up. So the y-axis here is times of a speed up, it's not percentage. So as we can see, CRISP can generate up to more than 20 times speed up compared with the baseline. On the right is the inference. It's actually even larger. It can generate more than 60%, sorry, 60 times speed up. All right, so in conclusion, we built CRISP, a critical path analysis based tool to analyze the complex microservice traces. It offers three main important uh, components. Top-down analysis for the service level insights, bottom-up analysis for the system-wide insights, and anomaly detection to build a better automatic alerting systems. And the code is available on the GitHub. And if you have any questions, feel free to shoot us an email. And thanks for your time. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Also, I will be at a poster session, so we can chat more if you want.